Uh, today's program will last approximately 90 minutes. Uh, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. And we do encourage you to submit written questions uh, during the program. You can type your question into the Q&A widget open on the left-hand side of your screen, and we will respond to those at the end of the program. Uh, if we do happen to run out of time before getting to your question, uh, we will definitely follow up with you afterwards via email. Uh, so don't worry about that. Uh, the webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open, including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you do experience any technical difficulties during the presentation, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help button below the presentation window, which is designated with a question mark icon. Additionally, a PDF copy of today's presentation slides are available for download in the resource list widget also open on the left-hand side of your screen. And Foley will apply for CLE credit following this web conference. If you did not already supply your bar state and license number upon registering, please do email that information to me as soon as possible. Uh, my name is Allison Jones, and my email address is ajones at foley.com. To be eligible for CLE, you will need to be logged into this ON24 session for the duration of today's program. And you will also be asked to answer two polling questions throughout the program. Please note that certificates of attendance will be distributed to eligible participants via email approximately eight weeks after the web conference today. And as a final note, uh, for those of you who are seeking Kansas, New York, and or New Jersey CLE credit, please note you are required to complete an attorney affirmation form in addition to answering the polling questions during today's program. Two five-digit course codes will be announced at different times today. Please email those codes with your completed attorney affirmation form. Again, to me, that is Allison Jones at ajones at foley.com uh, immediately following the program. A link to that form was included in your confirmation email. Another copy is also available in the resource list widget. Uh, you are also welcome to email me at any time for another copy. Uh, thank you all, and with that, I will now turn the program over to our moderator, uh, Mr. Mark Neuberger, who is Chair of Foley & Lardner's Labor and Employment Practice Group. Uh, thank you, Allison. That's not quite true. I'm substituting for Kevin Hyde, nope, who's resident in our Jacksonville office, who is our Chair of Labor and Employment, who at the last minute was called out of town on business. I am not the Chair. I'm resident in our Miami office, where I practice all aspects of labor and employment, and before becoming an attorney, worked in human resources for a Fortune 100 company for 10 years. Before we get to our first speaker, a couple, it wouldn't be a legal seminar if we didn't have disclaimers. Um, number one, um, our, our goal today is to analyze and prognosticate. We are not giving any specific legal advice to any particular listener. Number two, uh, two topics of great interest, I'm sure, to all of you, the Affordable Care Act and immigration law issues will not be discussed today. We made a conscious decision not to include them because those topics in and of themselves each could probably take an hour and a half given their complexity. We do anticipate that our colleagues at Foley and Lartner who specialize in those areas will be issuing uh, <clears throat> bulletins and may have separate webinars on those topics. I would encourage you that if you have any burning issues related to those, send me an email and I will forward them on to the appropriate people so that when they do do their um, webinars or publications, they can address your concerns. Um, finally, as I said, our goal today is to analyze and prognosticate. Unfortunately, the uh, long drawn out political campaign we just completed was not very deep in policy debates um, on issues that we're going to talk about today, and the positions of both candidates were hard to discern, with possibly the exception of their positions on the minimum wage and trade issues. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, each of our speakers today has spent a great deal of time in the last few days utilizing their background and experience in particular areas of labor and employment law to try to come up with some goals um, and some, topic, uh, some ideas of what you should be paying attention to in the future, and we want to share those with you. So getting uh, first to our first speaker, Jesse Panuccio is a partner in the litigation department of the Miami office of Foley and Lardner. Jesse has some very unique experience in that from 2013 to 2016, Jesse served as the executive director of the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. 
In this role, he was effectively the chief labor official and chief land use official for uh, the state of Florida, i.e. he was essentially our secretary of labor. Under his leadership, the agency developed and implemented uh, a fraud detection program for unemployment compensation insurance. Before that, Jesse served as the general counsel and prior to that, the deputy general counsel to our governor, Rick Scott. And in those roles, he represented the governor in his official capacity in a number of major litigation cases. He managed the legal affairs and legal staff of the governor's office. He advised on potential lit litigation veto power. He actually drafted executive orders and helped coordinate litigation strategy. Before all of that, he was a litigator at a uh, um, in trial and appellate law, law in Washington, D.C., and Jesse actually occupies offices in both Miami and Washington. So Jesse's going to kick it off because one of the things we suspect is on everybody's mind is what is the ability of the Trump administration to roll back regulations and executive orders um, that have come down in the last few years under the Obama administration. So, Jesse, um, why don't you take us through how that process works so we can understand what a new administration can and can't do in its early days? Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you for that introduction. Really pleased to be with everyone today uh, to talk about this and prognosticate a bit on, on what might happen. Uh, to jump right in, as, as you said, we don't know all the specifics uh, of the regulatory agenda that the Trump administration will have, but it's safe to assume, like any change uh, in administrations, the Trump administration will want to overturn or reverse or alter course on various uh, executive actions of the Obama administration. And to do that, uh, it's not as easy as what you hear on the stump, which is on day one, I'll issue an executive order reversing everything or, or charting a new course. There is uh, a lot of law around this. And so let me go into a bit of detail on the different kinds of processes that the Trump administration would face. The first is for any agency rule that is promulgated pursuant to the Administrative Procedure Act, an actual rule, not an executive order, but something that went through agency notice and comment. Uh, there's several different things that could happen. If the rule is already published in the Federal Register and the effective date has already passed, then the options uh, are limited. Uh, the first thing that the administration can do is go through notice and comment rulemaking to repeal it. But there's two issues with that. One, complete reversals by agencies are often met with skepticism by the federal courts, uh, can get an arbitrary and capricious uh, challenge. And two, the courts at the beginning of any new president's administration are full of appointees of the last president who may be more sympathetic to that last president's regulatory agenda, so increasing uh, the skepticism of any major about face by an agency. The second option would be full congressional repeal. Uh, the problem there, however, is you need to control, not just control the Senate, but have a filibuster-proof majority, which the Republicans do not have with 52 seats, so the Senate filibuster is a problem. Now there's, to further complicate things, an exception even there. Uh, under the Con Congressional Review Act that was passed uh, in the 1996 Contract with America, Congress can avoid, uh, and the Senate can avoid the filibuster in passing resolutions of disapproval if the rule uh, to be repealed had been published within 60 days legislative days uh, of the resolution, and that itself is a fluid date because it all depends on what legislative days the Senate has, and those rulings are made by the Senate parliamentarians. So that can be a very tricky issue to figure out whether you will have the, the route around uh, the Senate filibuster. Third, third way to get rid of a, a, a reg that's already on the books would be to support lawsuits against the regulations. The administration could refuse to defend them in court. Now that's a little bit dicey for the Justice Department and they have to figure out ways to do that and not uh, receive the ire of judges, but, but that, of course they have that litigation control. And a fourth option would be selective enforcement. Uh, this, of course, is controversial, as was seen during the Obama uh, presidency. There was a big debate over uh, that administration's decision not to enforce certain laws, and so now it will be interesting to see that debate perhaps flip uh, sides on, on who's on which side of that debate. Let me just put this in some context of, of something I know is probably on everyone's mind, and that is the overtime rule, which is due to go into effect uh, on December 1st. So what could be done with that? 
Uh, there could be a congressional repealer, but it would surely face the Senate filibuster uh, from the Democratic side. The Congressional Review Act window has likely closed because the rule was published on May 23rd, and is, by my count, I believe we've had 60 legislative days in the Senate since then. Uh, the, a complete repeal by the, or, or notice and comment repeal by the USDOL would, would face challenge in courts that it was arbitrary and capricious. Uh, a refusal to defend the current law, the rule in the current lawsuit by the states and the U.S. Chamber is a possibility. Uh, so we'd have to see how that would unfold. And then lastly, the USDOL could choose not to police violations, but of course there can be private actions under the Fair Labor Standards Act to enforce. So that wouldn't completely get rid of the, the rule either. So where are we right now? Companies need to comply by December 1st. It is still on the books unless and until there's a court injunction and then there are these options. So that's one, if it's a rule that's already been published and is already effective. If it's a rule that has been published but the effective date is sometime after Trump is inaugurated, he, they can issue an order postponing the effective dates and then figure out what to do. They can't get rid of the rule completely, but they can buy more time. Uh, third, if the rule is not yet published uh, in the Federal uh, Register, then it can simply die on the vine. Uh, so anything that is in the pipeline right now, although I don't think there are too many of those, most of these, uh, the Obama administration rushed out. So those are rules, and then let me quickly turn to executive orders, directives, and other executive actions that, that are not in the form of notice and comment rulemaking. Uh, President Obama did m a lot of this, uh, many EOs, executive orders, many executive directives. This one is pretty simple in theory. What was done this way can be undone this way right away. Now, in practice, there are costs associated with undoing uh, these things that maybe have already been baked into the market, but it is true that on day one, if President Trump wanted, he could come in, issue a single executive order that repealed every single executive order for the last eight years. Uh, so I think that uh, is a very quick summary of what can be done on the executive action side, uh, regulatory side, day one, and then beyond that in the Trump administration. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mark. Thanks. We'll come back to you a little later on uh, your thoughts on state, state and local matters. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Dabney Ware. She's resident in our Jacksonville office. Dabney is of counsel when she focuses her practice in the area of labor and employment law. She's had uh, experience in all aspects of employment-related litigation and counseling with clients, um, and in particular, does a lot of counseling and litigation in the area of wage-hour law. So to key off of Jesse's comments, and we know that um, the, the FLSA regs are on the minds of a lot of listeners, Dabney will be addressing what we see coming down the pike in the area uh, from the Department of Labor and the Wage Hour Administration. Dabney? Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. And everyone, I just kind of want to pick up kind of shortly where Jesse um, left us, which is largely kind of looking at this overtime regulation and the, the new salary threshold that's to be implemented December 1st. And, you know, if we talk about what's the current, uh, the, what's the status quo, what's the plan for today, well, that regulation, that change is still set to be implemented December 1 for you with employees that are impacted by this. That means you have to be prepared to implement that change. There are two cases, they're in the same uh, district court in Texas under the same judge um, that are challenging the implementation of that COL rule change. There is a hearing that is next Wednesday morning on November 16th um, to address whether or not uh, it's basically in part on a summary judgment hearing, but I think that what we'll hear is that judge will rule fairly quickly or at least clue us in that he's not going to rule um, as to whether there's going to be some sort of stay or injunction. But from the 16th to December 1st is essentially a two-week window with Thanksgiving in between. So the bottom line is everyone needs to be prepared to follow up, go with that rule, um, as a practical matter, you know, what do we think will happen? This is the prognostication part. It, it, it's a little, um, I think the election changes the likelihood of an injunction. It increases the likelihood just because as a practical matter, um, once the changes go into effect, 
we can expect there to be challenges. And I think that just makes it a little bit harder if the judge has any doubts or any thoughts that there's really a valid challenge to this rule, given the sweeping um, changes that it has to impact, that may cause the judge a little bit more pause. I don't think, I'm not trying to say at any level that the judge is impacted by politics, but I think the practical realities of how sweeping the change is and the likelihood of the challenge may influence the judge to essentially have a stay and let the legal challenges ride out and see where they land rather than have so many companies and employers um, facilitate this change only to then have it called back. Um, our judge, just for those of you who are interested, is someone who was nominated and appointed in 2014, so by Obama relatively recently, but had 10 years as a magistrate judge before that. So. I'm not sure that we can uh, read a lot into that, but I think the bottom line there is everyone needs to be kind of staying tuned in because there could well be some sort of alert or update towards the end of next week based on that court hearing, again, that's set for Wednesday morning, 16th, um, on the two cases that are challenging implementation of the overtime rule. If for some reason, uh, the rule is still set to go into effect on December 1st, then I think we fall back to the course of action or the possible courses of action that Jesse outlined and we can expect to see further challenges, but those will play out over time. I think the critical thing is the December 1st deadline and what we see, see and hear from next week's hearing. So that's kind of the overtime rule, which kind of leaves us, you know, at least somewhat up in the air, but again, the default is to be prepared to implement. I think from there we move on to minimum wage, which is at least in theory to me a little bit more interesting because for Trump there was actually a lot of back and forth that you could pick almost any position about minimum wage and we can see how that was going. You know, he's been made statements both supporting an increase to the federal minimum wage, he's made statements which indicate it should stay the same, and he's made statements which say it really should be left up to the state. I think as a practical matter from where we are, what we can expect to see with a change to the federal minimum wage is not much early on. Um, a couple of things make me think this is what's the case. First of all, more than half of the states already have their own minimum wage that is higher than the federal minimum wage. So I think as a more practical solution, it's not gonna be a priority in the Trump administration and I think what we're going to see likely is that more states are going to pass increased minimum wages. That gives the employees the benefits. That allows flexibility for the state. And I think if we see any increase to the federal minimum wage, it's going to be later in the administration, not early on. Um, the other thing I think that just supports that is that Trump has said several things really that what he wants to do to increase um, the uh, wages of people is really make an impact on the job. And the other thing is that if he makes a change in taxes, people may not have a change, uh, an increase in their wages, but may still essentially have more take home pay, more financial flexibility. So I think we're gonna see those changes come first. Changes in taxes, changes to, um, Trump wants to make to jobs, and changes in state minimum wages rather than an increase early on to the federal minimum wage. That comes, is going to come later. And then finally, I think the thing that we can expect to see really is what happens to agency enforcement. Because under the current administration, um, the wage now enforcement has been pretty aggressive, not as much flexibility um, in terms of when there are what might be possible violations, not as much flexibility in assessing fines or allowing corrections. We've had relatively aggressive enforcement, and I think there are going to be two things that are um, impacting this, two primary things at least. One is, I think we can expect to see a change to the department's budget. So there are probably just less resources to follow through on enforcement. The other thing is I think we can just see a, see a shift in attitudes where the investigators or the, the uh, department has been pretty aggressive, seeking opportunities to kind of really uh, be aggressive in their posture. Just don't think we're going to see the same type of enforcement attitude. 
and we're not going to have the same re resources going forward. So we can expect a little bit more flexibility and, frankly, probably a lot more flexibility when it comes to enforcement decisions. So I think those are the top three things we can expect with wage and hour from a federal perspective. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Dabney. Next, we're going to turn it over to Dan Kaplan, who's a partner in our Madison, Wisconsin office. Dan um, has a lot of experience in litigating before various state and federal agencies, but in particular has litigated on behalf of employers many safety and health-related matters, including those before the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. He's defended employers in OSHA matters throughout the country and in over a dozen matters involving employee fatalities. So, Dan, tell us what we can expect in the area of health and safety regulation. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think we are going to see some big changes, actually. I think we're going to move away from the focus, which has been historically under the Obama administration, on enforcement and see a much more friendly uh, return of the consultation program that we had under the Bush administration. What I want to cover in my very brief time is really three things. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the injury and illness reporting rule that was recently updated and is scheduled to take effect on January 1. I'll talk a little bit about the enhanced penalty assessment that became effective this past August 1st, and then I will touch very briefly on the fact that the ACA violations have been incorporated under OSHA's jurisdiction for whistleblower uh, attention. First, as many people know, injury and illness reporting has historically taken place by the employer maintaining its own records and then filing uh, a form that is a summary of that year's or that prior year's injury and illness occurrences in that work site. Um, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration passed a new rule that requires the reporting of injuries and illnesses to be done electronically. That new rule takes effect on January 1 with the first submission implementation date of July 1 for any establishments that have 250 or more employees or who have fewer than 250 employees but more than 20 as it relates to what they call high-risk industries. And just to uh, set aside any belief that you may have that you're not in a high-risk industry, the list of high-risk industries under the Occupational Safety and Health Administration guidance for this new rule is about 60 areas long, and you're probably covered by it anyways. So this new electronic reporting will take effect for most folks uh, beginning July 1. Because it has a July 1 date of action, I think we will see some effort to stop it. There's been a lot of outcry with this reporting obligation, and I believe that uh, most pundits believe that this will be put aside prior to its actual implementation on July 1. If it is put aside, that will save a lot of employers a lot of time from the electronic filing. Uh, the enhanced penalty assessment process. Unfortunately, as of August 1, penalties for OSHA violations uh, increased significantly. They went from a maximum of $7,000 to $12,471 on other than serious and serious violations. They went from $70,000 to $124,709 on repeat and willful violations. This was a increase that was passed in the 2015 budget uh, legislation. So I do not see this rolling back at all. Um, it was voted on by the full Congress and included in the full Congress budget when it went through. The thing that I think may be a little bit different on a going forward basis is whereas the Obama administration has been focused on utilizing the full penalty amount since August on its recent citations, so it's not uncommon at all to see a violation with a penalty of $12,471. 
I think the new OSHA will be a softer, more gentle OSHA, but it may take a little bit of time before that comes to fruition. Under the Bush administration, we saw a very strong consultation program where employers could utilize OSHA for help in identifying safety programs, in implementing safety programs, and in outlining um, needs, outlining needs that employees had in order to uh, remain safe in their work environment. That pretty much went away towards the latter years of the Obama administration, such that all of the focus under OSHA was on enforcement. That's going to change. I think we're going to see a very strong consultation program. I think we'll see some conversion of enforcement compliance officers to consultation compliance officers, as we had under Bush. And I think we may see a more kinder, gentler OSHA on a moving forward basis. Finally, uh, within the last two months, uh, OSHA il uh, issued its whistleblower rules and procedures on how to process ACE alleged ACA violations. The rules and procedures are really no different than many of the other whistleblower prosecution rules that OSHA has for its myriad other statutes that it's responsible for enforcing or investigating. There is a 300-day period associated with a lot of that. Um, and so if anything changes in that regard, we may see a rollback on the statute of limitation period, but I don't view that as very likely, and I don't anticipate that there will be many changes in OSHA's whistleblower investigation obligations. Back to you, Mark. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Next, we're going to go to the West Coast, and uh, Krista Cabrera, who is of counsel and resident in our San Diego office, where she focuses her practice on employment litigation, counseling, and training. Those of you who have ever uh, had facilities or employees in California know that to some extent, California is a world unto its own when it comes to employment law, and, and Krista is, is uh, there to help employers understand those obligations. Krista is going to give us an explanation of what we uh, see coming down the pike from the EEOC. Thanks, Mark. Um, Really interesting timing here with the EEOC. Just last week, the EEOC issued its strategic enforcement plan for 2017 through 2021. And you can see on this slide here, I've linked to the plan. It's an extremely lengthy document. But what's really interesting, given um, that just a few days later, uh, we elected uh, the Republican nominee, um, is the fact that the commission had just announced uh, focusing on some areas that are really, I think, going to change now that we're seeing a, a, a Republican uh, ruled House, Senate, and presidency. Um, so first, immigrants' rights. The commission announced that it is going to have its district offices focus on immigrant, migrant, and other vulnerable workers within their areas. Um, you know, given Trump's stance on immigration, I think we can expect that to change drastically. Um, next, religious discrimination. The commission stated that it is going to focus on backlash discrimination against those who are Muslim or Sikh or persons of Arab, Middle Eastern, or South Asian descent, as well as people who are perceived to be members of these groups. Uh, given Trump's stance on uh, his sort of anti-Muslim stance, I think we can expect that to change as well. Um, so the question becomes, and we're kind of hearing a theme here, how does this change take place? Um, it's, it's not going to happen immediately. Um, the EEOC is a bipartisan commission, and it's comprised of five presidentially appointed members. Now, these members are appointed for staggered four- and five-year terms. Um, I suspect uh, the first uh, term that's going to come up is the chair's term, and that's up in July 2017. I suspect... Uh, a, a very, and she's an Obama appointment, a very conservative appointment um, will replace the chair, and that will continue to happen. Right now, the remaining uh, appointees are one George W. Bush appointee, and the remaining appointees were uh, Obama appointees. So, of course, new leadership, new direction. Um, now, another more drastic way that this could change is uh, 
the budget could be severely cut or eliminated so that the EEOC can't uh, enforce uh, the areas it said that it would be seeking to enforce in the strategic enforcement plan. Um, you know, most drastically, the uh, Kennedy created legislation that, that created the EEOC could potentially, um, in terms of you know, really, really changing things up, uh, be repealed. Another uh, focus area, according to the Strategic Enforcement Plan, is sexual orientation discrimination. And this is a really new area for the EEOC because Title VII does not specifically uh, list sexual orientation as a protected classification, unlike uh, California's similar law and some other state laws. Now, just three days ago, the EEOC prevailed um, in a sexual harassment uh, sorry, sexual orientation, harassment, and discrimination lawsuit. It prevailed on a motion to dismiss, obtained a ruling from a court saying that sexual orientation discrimination is discrimination because of sex and that the case could proceed. Now, while Trump hasn't taken much of a stance one way or the other on LGBT rights, Mike Pence championed a religious freedom law that allowed certain private businesses to discriminate against the LGBT community. So if Pence has anything to say, this area could change as well. Um, another change we could see with the EEOC, some of you may remember that on the campaign trail, Trump touted Ivanka Trump's idea of six weeks of paid maternity and elder care leave. So if the FMLA is expanded or a new law is instituted to create this type of leave, then the EEOC would be uh, enforcing and regulating um, that type of new leave law. Um, so those are really the, I think, the main areas of potential change we can see, we can anticipate with the EEOC. And that's it for me. Back to you. Thank you, Krista. We're now going to crisscross the country all the way up to our Boston office and ask um, our partner Don Schroeder to talk about matters before the NLRB. Um, Don regularly handles traditional labor matters, of course, representing management in such things as union avoidance training, unfair labor practice proceedings, union elections, mass picketing, 10-J injunctions, labor arbitrations, and actually has handled numerous collective bargaining uh, sessions on behalf of employers, as well as the legal work uh, that comes along with labor strikes. So, Don, tell us what we can expect from the NLRB. Thanks, Mark. Uh, good afternoon. I think uh, the theme that you've been hearing throughout this afternoon is uh, uh, changes afoot, and that's certainly true with respect to the area of traditional labor and labor law matters before the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, it is not unusual. In fact, it's happened numerous times, and I'll go through some of those examples, uh, where there's a change of the uh, party in power, and it then has a dramatic impact upon traditional labor law matters that are pending before the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, certain doctrines, in fact, have uh, flip-flopped two or three times over a 40-year period, which obviously keeps things interesting in this area of the law. And, and I'm certainly not uh, going to be surprised, and I don't think anybody should be surprised, if it happens again in this next presidency cycle. Uh, under uh, the Obama administration, uh, there was a fairly uh, progressive, proactive agenda that certainly had an NLRB seeking to expand the scope of its jurisdiction, whether it relates to uh, the scope of confidentiality agreements or the impact of social media in the context of uh, not only union employers but also non-union employers. Uh, so against that backdrop, we have currently uh, the current makeup of the NLRB like a number of other uh, government agencies, this agency has five members. It's a five-member board. Currently, there are three members. Uh, one is Gaston Pierce, who's a Democrat, appointed through August 2018. Lauren McFerrin, uh, December 2019, also a Democrat. And Philip Miscamara, uh, through December 2017, a Republican. So you've got a 2-1 split, Democrats to Republicans currently, with two openings. Uh, and I think, uh, and these are five-year terms with, uh, where you need to uh, receive the consent of the Senate. Now, 
you may recall in the early years of the Obama administration, uh, there was a lot of fighting uh, regarding that last part, consent of the Senate. And the NLRB for a period of time didn't even have a quorum, uh, point, mainly because appointments were held up at the Senate. I don't obviously foresee this being an issue based upon the fact that uh, the presidency and Senate are in the same party at this point. And so I would expect appointments by the Trump administration for the two open slots at the NLRB to happen uh, fairly quickly uh, in the early part of 2017. I also would not expect a delay uh, or much of a delay in getting to the full complement uh, through the consent of the Senate, uh, getting up to the, the, the full complement of five, which would then leave a 3-2 split Republicans to Democrats at the NORB. Well, what, what does this all mean going forward uh, over the next few years? Well, in light of the, the current makeup of the NORB and the fact that uh, there are a, a number of openings that will allow the Trump administration to uh, jigger the, the NORB into a, a state where it's a 3-2 split Republicans to Democrats, uh, I think the initial expectations, uh, at least internally at the NORB, are, are fairly small. I don't, I don't think we're going to have a dial... I don't think we're going to have issuance of general counsel memoranda and reports on the uh, interplay of social media and its potential impact on Section 7 protected concerted activities. I, I think you'll see a less active NORB in the short term. Uh, and unlike a uh, Clinton presidency, which would have uh, been a continuation of Obama's agenda, uh, now there'll be, I think, a pause in any major activity at the NORB in the short term, uh, and I doubt there'll be any major developments in the next few months other than seeking the appointment of uh, these two additional uh, members of the NORB to, to make it so that it gets to the full complement uh, of five. Uh, at the same time, and this, it, this is consistent with other comments by uh, some of my partners, I would expect that the NORB's enforcement mechanism, whether it would be in the form of its uh, outside investigations or the pursuit of 10-J injunctions and other injunctive relief, will uh, subside and there will be uh, less uh, vigorous uh, pursuit of those kinds of investigations and enforcement actions. Against this backdrop, what, what, is that, what are the implications as far as the current doctrines that have been uh, established during the Obama administration. And this is consistent, this will most likely be consistent with what I said at the outset, which is the fact that certain doctrines uh, will potentially flip-flop over the next few years. Well, what are those doctrines? Well, one is the joint employer doctrine. It, obviously, the joint employer doctrine has a major impact on franchisors and franchisees, employers and staffing firms, and private equity firms and portfolio companies. Uh, the BFI decision by the NORB in August of 2015 is on appeal at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and uh, it is expected that a decision will come down fairly soon. That, that decision by the NORB uh, revamped and expanded the joint employer doctrine uh, substantially so that not only uh, do you look at uh, the various indicia of a joint employer, but just the fact that you have the right to set the terms and conditions of employment, but even if you have not exercised them, that that would still be indicia of joint employer, uh, a joint employer doctrine. Um, it is very likely that that doctrine will be revisited and there will be a, a resurgence to the old NORB standard, which basically uh, expected that there was an exercising of the actual uh, right of control, not just an indirect control. And so I would not be surprised to see the NLRB, NLRB uh, under the Trump administration to revisit that doctrine. I also expect that uh, the NLRB under the Trump administration will look more closely at how statutory employees are, have been defined in the context of graduate students and undergraduate 
uh, teaching assistants and graduate assistants. And uh, you may recall that the Columbia University decision that came down this past August uh, overruled the Brown University decision from 2004 on the issue of whether or not uh, graduate teaching assistants and student uh, teaching assistants could be employees under the NORB and therefore could unionize. And so uh, I would not be surprised if perhaps there's another Ivy League school that becomes the subject of this doctrine uh, in the uh, near term. At this point, turn it over back over to, to Mark. Thanks, Don. We'll now go to the midsection of the country and our Milwaukee office, where we're going to ask Carmen Cowden to speak about matters affecting uh, federal government contractors under the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. Carmen is a partner in our Milwaukee office, and um, along with labor and employment practices in our automotive, food and beverage, and manufacturing industry teams. She represents uh, and counsels employers in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship and has, uh, in, in, in particular, focused work under Executive Order 11246 and all of the other various affirmative action laws and regulations. She regularly uh, assists employers in the preparation of affirmative action plans and has represented employers uh, against those OFCCP in the context of various compliance reviews and investigations. So, Carmen, tell us what we can expect. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Um, I think we were going to actually break and do a CLE question, perhaps at this at this point. Um, I'll dive in after that. Allison, did you need to read something? Yes, thank you, and, and thanks, Carmen. We'll get right back to you. Um, before we do, I'm just going to briefly go over uh, the CLE course code for today's program. Uh, this will be the first of two codes that I read. So if you are uh, requesting CLE credit, be sure you enter the five-digit code. I'm about to read into the polling question form that will appear uh, as soon as I read the code. So uh, please write the code down and be prepared to type it into uh, the next slide here in a couple minutes. Uh, please note that this course code will be read only twice. Uh, this first one is all letters. Uh, so uh, it's a five-digit letter. Uh, the polling question will remain open for one minute exactly to allow time for you to submit that answer. So please do so promptly, uh, and please be sure to hit the Submit button so that your, your answer is recorded properly. As a reminder, uh, for those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit, in addition to answering these two polling questions, uh, please remember that you will also need to complete the attorney affirmation form and return it to my attention following the program. Uh, again, a copy of that form is found in your confirmation email, as well as in the resource list widget. So at this time, I'm going to read the first course code. And that code is the letters D as in David, M as in Mary, Q as in Queen, Z as in Zebra, and E as in Edward. I will repeat that code once more. It is the letters D as in David, M as in Mary, Q as in Queen, Z as in Zebra, and E as in Edward. And I will flip to the polling question here now. Please enter that five-digit code. This, uh, this form will remain open for one minute, at which time it will close, and we will move forward with Carmen's presentation. Thanks, Allison. So with respect to the OFCCP and um, the impact that ultimately this election will have on government contractors, I would expect that, that the impact overall will be fairly significant. Um, much of in, in the other areas, the, the priorities for the Trump administration is likely, are likely to be very different from those that would have been in place under a, a, a democratic administration. And in, in one of those areas um, is, is going to probably be the compliance review process itself. 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that compliance review process and how we're likely to see that change uh, with this administration. And then I'll touch a little bit on um, some of the recent executive orders and rules and, and, and what the impact might be relative to those items. Um, and finally, I'll just end with some, some other issues that may be possible focus areas or maybe possible um, areas uh, to, to keep an eye, eyeball out for um, in this current administration. So with respect to the compliance reviews, you know, under Obama, the administration's focus has been on very active enforcement, just as it has in a number of the other um, employment arenas. And that active enforcement has meant um, broad jurisdiction, so using these joint employment concepts to pull in related companies, staffing agencies, temp agencies, and, and other entities that aren't directly contracting with the government. It's meant deep dives into data, particularly applicant data and compensation data, along with multiple requests for information. And then there has been a, a major focus on sort of the alleged systemic discrimination um, that affects, affects a number of people. Um, as a result, the audits have gone on for years and years and years before the OFCCP has, has come to some sort of finding, whether that be a finding of violation or, or a finding that the audit can be closed. I think that is definitely going to be impacted and will likely change with this next administration. The OFCCP budget, even under um, Obama, has been reduced for the past several years, and I would expect that that will continue under a Trump administration, it's likely to continue to be reduced, and, and some even opine um, it, it might be reduced so significantly that um, the, 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 the OFCCP itself may, be, may become something of a non-factor. Um, certainly the length and the depth of the compliance reviews are likely to be scaled back significantly with um, perhaps a return to the Bush administration approach of doing uh, uh, more of a desk audit phase and then closing things out if there aren't any significant indicators on the front end instead of continuing to dig and dig and dig um, for, for um, additional potential indicators. Additionally, with respect to compensation, that has certainly been a, a huge focus during the Obama administration. Um, on that front, certainly um, Mr. Trump's campaign messaging has suggested that there might continue to be some commitment to addressing pay equity issues, but I think it, it, it's um, certainly not likely that the OFCCP's current aggressive investigation tactics relative to compensation are likely to continue. It, we are much less likely to see these deep dives, this continual digging um, and, and the really deep analysis that's been done under the Obama administration. That has come in part um, due to sort of the pressure to find some sort of disparity um, and to show results uh, as this, this administration winds down. With respect to the recent um, executive orders and rules, uh, we've already talked a little bit about how that process would work and, and we've heard from some of, of the other folks. Uh, about what, what is likely to happen in other areas. Um, in the government contracting world, uh, there were lots and lots and lots of executive orders and regulations uh, passed during President Obama's terms. Um, oftentimes what couldn't get done in other areas um, was ultimately affected through the uh, executive order process for government contractors. And so we got regulations related to affirmative action for veterans and individuals with disabilities, we had updated sex discrimination guidelines. We had the additional protections related to sexual orientation and gender identity, requirements for paid sick leave, pay secrecy prohibitions, the modified EEO-1 reporting to require pay data disclosure, and then we had the um, uh, disclosure of, of L&E violations or the sort of the, the people refer to it as the blacklisting rule, the fair pay and safe workplaces executive order all that kicked in uh, during um, Obama's terms. Of these, um, certainly the regulations related to vets and, and disabilities, um, the sex discrimination updates, and pay secrecy are probably the least likely to see any significant pushback under a Trump administration. They've, they've either already 
been in effect for so long that um, most contractors have adjusted to them um, and have already made the changes that are required to comply with those, those new requirements, or they're the kinds of requirements that are consistent with other kinds of um, labor and employment laws such that companies are already uh, complying and, and, and therefore don't have um, a lot of interest in pushing back on those. In contrast, um, you've got the Fair Pay and Safe Workplaces Executive Order and the modifications to the EEO-1 report. Those are perhaps the most likely to see some pushback and, and, and to maybe see some delay in implementation, delay in an, an effective date so the Trump administration can figure out what they want to do. Um, they are the ones that, that most recently became final this fall and they're due to kick in in either 2017 or later. Um, the Fair Pay and Safe Workplaces uh, order is already enjoined in part, and um, as Jesse suggested might be an option, um, this might be one of those areas where the government chooses not to, to, to defend those regulations going forward. Um, on the sexual orientation and gender identity and paid sick leave fronts, those are perhaps um, the ones that could go either way. Um, certainly those requirements were the result of executive orders, and some Republicans have certainly been very vocal about criticizing um, legislating versus through, through executive order. However, um, we've also heard about the fact that uh, Ivanka Trump has spoken out in favor of these some paid leave policies, and certainly the effort to eliminate protections for sexual orientation and gender, gender identity would have a, a, a high political cost associated with them. Finally, just a couple of other things that you might see under the Trump administration in the government contracting world. Um, maybe some possible scrutiny of disparate impact theories. Those are the theories where you have neutral policies and practices that have different impacts on different protected groups. Um, maybe some less appetite for pursuing violations based on those kinds of theories. Uh, possibly the appointment of a more business-focused OFCCP director who will be more concerned about balancing both the burdens and the benefits, and maybe even um, an increase in the contracting thresholds at which some of the more onerous um, affirmative action reporting and other kinds of requirements kick in for contractors. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Mark. Thank you very much. Our next speaker um, brings a very unique perspective to the presentation today, L.G. Sims, who's in our Chicago office. Uh, why? Because L.G., in addition to working in our firm's uh, <clears throat> government affairs and municipal finance practice, is actually a sitting member of the Illinois uh, House of Representatives, representing the 34th District of, of Illinois uh, which my geography is correct, includes portions of the south side of Chicago and on down along the lake towards Indiana. He serves as the and, – and he won re-election on Tuesday. He serves as chairman of the Illinois House Judiciary Criminal Committee and as a member of the Business Occupational License Committee. Um, he's focused on improving quality of schools, strengthening the middle class by creating good jobs, bringing fiscal discipline to state government, and passing common sense public safety initiatives to make communities safer. So, Jesse, given your unique, uh, LG, I mean, your unique uh, perspective, take us through what's going on in the state and local level, both in Illinois but across the country. Thank, thanks, Mark, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, yeah, continuing the theme of, of prognostication for today's session, I want to discuss the election outcomes and where I believe uh, states and lo state and local governments will go and where we currently stand with uh, gubernatorial elections and our legislative chambers following the 2016 election. Uh, you know, I, let me let me start by saying I would I would believe that uh, the outcomes from Tuesday were certainly not what most of most would have uh, anticipated uh, at the top of the ticket. But you know, going down the ticket at the state and local level, there were significant uh, elections uh, in both. There were 12 states that held gubernatorial contests with. Uh, Republicans taking seven of the 12, and Democrats taking four, uh, with Democrats leading in an, in an additional race in North Carolina that's currently separated by less than one point and less than 5,000 votes. Uh, but there was significant uh, 
impact of you know, uh, legislative and legislative bodies. Right now, following Tuesday's election, all 30 of the southern legislative chambers are being are held by Republicans. Uh, that includes the Kentucky House, which has been in Democratic hands until since 1922. Uh, in closer to home in the Midwest, there were four uh, chambers held by Democrats. That's now down to two following the transition or the reclaiming of the, the Minnesota Senate and the Iowa Senate by Republicans. Uh, following Tuesday's election, I think there were also some, some bright spots for Democrats. Uh, Nevada legislature was retaken by Democrats, uh, so it's both, both the House and the Senate. Uh, the New Mexico House was also retaken by the Senate. Uh, the Hawaii Senate is now uh, under complete Democratic control. It's the first time that's happened in any legislative chamber since 1980. Um, and the reality is that the pendulum has, has swung towards Republicans, and uh, there is, the reality is there's nowhere to go but, but up for Democrats. Uh, the, but what does that mean? It means that we're going to see, I think, increased activity at the state and local level. You're going to see activity where Congress may not weigh in on on minimum uh, issues like minimum wage. I think you're going to see more activity at the state and local level on those issues. I think you're going to see additional uh, activity on tax policy. Uh, in fact, uh, today, uh, Cook County, the largest county in, in Illinois, is taking up a sugar tax. But you're also going to see increased activity on ballot initiatives. Uh, 26 states and the District of Columbia offer initiative referendum or veto rights to citizens. And uh, 2016 elections of the 162 statewide ballot initiatives, over 40% of those were put on the ballot through that, through that process. So I think we're going to see increased activity on the initiative front just as we did in 2016. For instance, uh, we saw marijuana usage on the ballot in nine states and passed in eight of those nine. Uh, that was medical use of marijuana in four states, including Arkansas, Florida, Montana, and North Dakota. Uh, again, I think it's important to note that as we see increased activity in the marijuana policy, on the marijuana policy front, that those are Republican states that were won handily by Trump. Uh, and so I think we're, we're going to have to forecast and look at the evolution of marijuana policy going forward. In addition, there, marijuana usage was improved or was on the ballot for recreational purposes in five states uh, and only rejected in one. So it was on the ballot in, in Arizona, California, Massachusetts, Maine, and Nevada, and only defeated in Arizona. So again, I think I think we're going to see, we're going to see additional work on the marijuana policy front. Just as on minimum wage I talked about earlier, without action from Congress, I think you're going to see more states start to take up um, minimum wage issues. I was on the ballot in five states and only defeated in one. And you're, we're going to see additional policy, we're going to see additional ballot initiatives regarding tax policy and health care policy, non policy. In those spaces where there's a, there's a void of Congress weighing in, I think we're going to see increased activity on the on the state and local referendum front. Uh, so I'm excited to see what's going to happen next, uh, but I think we're going to see, it's going to be important that uh, companies be prepared for you know increased activity at, at the state and local level. With that, Mark, I'll turn it over back to you. Thanks, LG. I now want to turn it back to Jesse Panuccio given his unique uh, perspective on state government and uh, see if you have any additional comments on, uh, in terms of state and local developments. Well, thanks, Mark, and, and thanks, LG. I, I agree with uh, a lot of what you said. Just to um, reiterate, you know, the map before the election, uh, legislatures uh, across the country, Republicans controlled both chambers in 30 states, Democrats controlled both chambers in 12 states, and there was split control in seven. And then uh, just for fun, I'll note Nebraska has a nonpartisan unicameral legislature, so we don't count that one when we do these counts. It's the only legislature like that in the country. Uh, also, before the election governorships, 31 of 50 were Republicans. So now what we see is that uh, the, the switches that LG talked about, what we now have is Republicans controlling both chambers in 32 
legislatures, Democrats controlling both chambers in 13 states, uh, three states with split control, and I believe control in New York is still being decided, uh, although I may have missed the latest results on that. Governorships, uh, Republicans will have at least 33, although it looks like the North Carolina race uh, uh, will go uh, to, if the, if the recount holds the current results, will go to the Democratic candidates, so the Democrats will have held North Carolina and Montana. So what you see, at least from a uh, control standpoint, is a slight uptick in Republican control on a map that was fairly dominated by Republicans uh, to begin with. Uh, and then, of course, you've had uh, these same policy issues. I, I would also add there were right-to-work laws on several ballots. Uh, Alabama added a right-to-work provision to its constitution. Virginia rejected a right-to-work constitutional amendment but already has a statute, so from a policy standpoint, nothing changes. Uh, and then South Dakota voters rejected a measure permitting unions to charge non-union members for services received under the union contract. So uh, agree completely that we're seeing this uptick in referenda activity. Um, you know, just from a uh, governance standpoint, uh, if I suppose if the referenda are for things you like, you cheer them, although it has, was my experience in, in state government that policies that get passed through referenda, often a constitutional amendment, often are not as well thought out as legislation. Uh, they don't go through the multi-year process. You can see this, for example, in some of the marijuana laws and, and the lack of definition around them. So there is some concern, I think, uh, around constitutionalizing these uh, policy choices, uh, especially when the effects are, are unknown. Uh, let me also just comment on the, the uh, what I think may be a labor implication for the rising tide of uh, marijuana ballot measures, which is if uh, the legalization of marijuana, either medical or recreational, or medical leaking into recreational because of lack of enforcement, uh, has what I think is a fairly predictable effect of increasing marijuana use. Uh, workplaces that either don't have or haven't addressed for a while their drug testing policies may find uh, need for that in the future. So that may be uh, an unintended result that is quite relevant to uh, the people participating on this call and to HR departments generally. With that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Mark. Thanks, Jesse. In a few minutes, we're going to get to the question and answer session. I have a few questions that were submitted in uh, before today's session. We encourage everybody to use the chat feature on your screens to start sending in questions, and we'll try to get to them. Um, in a few minutes, to the extent we don't get to any questions, we will try to follow up with you. But of course, any one of you should feel free to follow up with any of our speakers today. So please utilize the chat feature. Um, and kind of wrapping things up, I wanted to talk uh, just a few minutes about uh, the state of the labor union movement in America and what might come um, in the next years under the Trump administration. As we entered the election cycle here, 6.7% um, of the American workforce was unionized. That includes both public and private sectors. The rate of unionization in the private, public sector is significantly higher than it is in the public sector, uh, private sector. And the rate of unionization varies pretty significantly amongst different states and regions of the country. The 6.7% of the workforce being unionized is, is the lowest it's been in over 60 years and has been a steady decline over the last 8 to 10 years. That does not portend well for organized labor. Um, at the same time, the uh, um, union movement pumped $108 million, or, or actually closer to $110 million, in political spending during this last election cycle on the federal level. To give you some idea, that uh, $110 million is up from $78 million four years ago, or basically a 30% um, um, increase in political spending by organized labor. And so the question is, looking back on this election, is what did they get for their $110 million? And I think the answer is absolutely nothing. And I think it portends not only the way we've seen a division of politics in this country, 
it seems to me anyway that these numbers reflect a division within the labor uh, union movement itself. For example, key states that helped win the election for Trump, Iowa, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, all pulled for Trump. These are, um, and, and what is interesting is, so if we have 6.7% of the national workforce unionized, Iowa is at 107 Michigan's at 14.5 or almost double. Ohio's at 12.4%, almost double. Pennsylvania, 12.7. And Wisconsin, 11.7. So these states are unionized at rates twice that of the national average. And yet, despite the spending and despite uh, a traditional role of organized labor and political campaigns, right, is the ground game, getting out the vote. And they were very active in these key states, trying to get out the vote for organized labor. Um, and I should say that virtually uh, very few, if any, national labor unions endorsed Donald Trump. The exception you'll find is in law enforcement. And you may recall he made a big play about the fact that the union representing the Border Patrol agents endorsed him. So what you saw was a huge financial effort and uh, um, political effort on the part of organized labor that probably got them absolutely nothing. And because of that, there seems to be a divide among union members and how they vote and the decisions being made uh, by organized labor. Will people then become uh, unhappy with their unions because this is the tack they approach? That remains to be seen. But what can we expect from the Trump administration um, when it comes with that? I, I am an ex-New Yorker and have followed Donald's uh, career for over 30 years. One of the things, and, and it kind of pulls two ways when it comes to organized labor. Number one, as we all know, he's a successful real estate developer and builder in Manhattan. Nothing gets built in Manhattan without uh, union labor. It is one of the most concentrated unionized sections of the country, the New York City construction industry. And so he was able to successfully negotiate that in whatever way to get all of his buildings built. And if you look back, the history reflects he had very few labor problems um, and was able to work with organized labor in that context. At the same time, most recently, you may be aware that uh, his Trump Hotel in Las Vegas was found to engage in, uh, by the NLRB, was found to engage in unfair labor practices um, and, in fact, refused to bargain with the union that work, organized their workers there. The other thing, as you heard from our state uh, discussion, there's been a wave of states uh, implementing right-to-work laws Let's not forget that our Vice President-elect Mike Pence, as governor of Indiana, advocated for and got Indiana, a very uh, also strong union state, uh, to pass right-to-work law, as did most recently Wisconsin and Michigan. So there seems to be a tie turning, right-to-work being, of course, um, the prohibition against mandatory uh, union membership and union dues. Um, it will be also interesting and uh, to see who becomes the Secretary of Labor um, in the Trump administration. There's very little information out there on this. One of the names mentioned, interestingly, is Governor Scott, Scott Walker from Wisconsin, who you will recall early on in his, his, his first administration was very active in passing in Wisconsin anti-union legislation, some of which has been overturned by the Wisconsin courts. Now, yesterday, Governor Walker issued a statement that was reported in the Milwaukee Journal ruling out a position in the Trump cabinet. However, he has only two years left on his last term. And as we know from early in the uh, Republican uh, primary campaigns, he had designs on achieving national office. Would he accept the position in the Trump cabinet? That remains to be seen, would be offered Department of Labor. He does have, he is, uh, and has always touted himself as an experienced business person. The other name that keeps coming up is Victoria Lipnick, who is a member of the EEOC and has been sitting in the EEOC since 2010. She has prior work experience as a management side labor and employment law at Safarth Shaw. She was active in, in the Department of Labor itself and, interestingly, was mentioned as a possible uh, selection for a high-level labor position in a uh, Mitt Romney administration, which obviously never came about. So um, 
a lot of change, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, nothing um, is for sure. Again, we encourage you to send in your questions. Um, and uh, with that, I have a few of the earlier questions that I'd like to address to some of our panel. Uh, Dan, could you elaborate a little bit? You talked about ocean whistleblower. Maybe a lot of our listeners don't know um, OSHA's role in whistleblower legislation having nothing to do with health and safety. Uh, sure. OSHA is responsible for conducting the investigations associated with whistleblower claims for some 20-odd uh, pieces of federal legisla legislation, including Sarbanes-Oxley and other uh, legislation. Um, the ACA is the latest piece of legislation that has a non-retaliation or anti-retaliation provision within it. Um, and whenever you see new legislation from a national or from Congress that includes anti-retaliation provisions, it's typically been and historically been assigned to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration for the investigatory uh, obligations associated with those kinds of claims. Part of the reason that OSHA gets that obligation is because of its regular investigatory role that it performs in other areas. And uh, in this way, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration budget has been kept probably unnaturally high due to the number of compliance officers that are employed solely for investigating and addressing whistleblower claims under these various acts. My follow-up to you, Dan, is you talked about an increased consultative role on the part of OSHA. Um, some people would say that's like inviting the fox to inspect the hen house. Um, do you want to comment on that and your experience? Sure. So historically under the Bush administration, the types of OSHA compliance officers uh, were divided. There were consultation officers and investigative enforcement officers. And there was e essentially a wall created between them. Uh, employers were encouraged to utilize the consultation services and the consultation compliance officers were not permitted to share information relative to that with the enforcement side. There's an exception to that, and that is if you brought in a consultation officer to your work site and they observed a violation and you didn't correct it, then it would have been referred over to the enforcement side. But historically, like I said, under the Bush administration, there was a fairly strong consultation program that worked quite well with the, uh, with employers in general, and it is one that I didn't have a problem utilizing. I wouldn't utilize it today under the current enforcement scheme that's in place because there's very little that's not pursued from an enforcement standpoint with the current administration. Um, so for the last eight to ten years or eight years, I, I did not encourage clients to utilize the approach of consultation with OSHA because everything leaked into enforcement. Going forward, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll return to what occurred under the Bush administration and you might find a friend over at OSHA. Thanks, Dan. Carmen, you were asked to elaborate on some comments you made uh, about OFCCP matters. Would you... Yeah, and, uh, and uh, I, I can I can comment on that. I think it was was where I, I sort of finished off um, the the last point I made uh, related to the possibility that a Trump Trump administration would look at increasing uh, the current thresholds for what it means to be a federal contractor. Right right now, a number of the obligations, the non discrimination obligations, certainly kick in at the at the ten thousand dollar contract level. And most of the, the paper reporting and other more onerous um, or more burdensome type uh, obligations kick in at the $50,000 level. There, there's, there's been some um, in the industry who think that a Trump administration might look at actually increasing that, that second level 
threshold to something higher um, so that it would open up the doors for more smaller businesses or mid-sized businesses to be able to engage in government contracting uh, without having to be subject to the, the various paper reporting and additional burden of, of some of the, the higher level obligations. And so that's, that's something that we could see happen under a Trump administration. Again, um, this, this particular area is probably not likely to be one of the first that, that uh, gets addressed, but certainly something that we might see over the term. Thanks, Carmen. Krista, um, could you expand a little bit on uh, what you might see as changes in family medical leave, as well as could you comment on the EOC, which is responsible for administering national origin discrimination, in light of a lot of the rhetoric we heard from Trump during the campaign, especially as to uh, foreigners, Muslims, etc.? Sure, I'll take those in order. So first, in terms of potential FMLA changes, I mean, all we know is that Trump touted his daughter's uh, uh, idea that she would like to expand or provide for the first time paid maternity leave and paid elder care leave, six weeks paid. Uh, you know, whether that was campaign talk or something he truly intends to make law is anyone's guess. Um, but it would likely be the FMLA that would be expanded were this to become law. I mean, I, I suppose there could also be a separate law. I mean, in, in California, we've got a pregnancy disability leave law in addition to the California, California Family Rights Act, in addition to the FMLA. So theoretically, there could be a, a new law created. Um, well, let me stop you there. The, Let's go to go Jesse. Let's go to Jesse and ask him what he thinks the prospects of paid family leave getting through Congress are. I would say minimal if it's standalone, although I could see it as part of a larger deal where, uh, you know, if there are things Paul Ryan wants to get done that Trump isn't necessarily uh, too hot on, if they have a large uh, sort of uh, economic reform bill, it, I, the only way I see it getting done is if it's part of a larger package. But standalone, I don't think it would happen in, in this Congress. And, you know, Trump's willingness and ability to wheel and deal, if you will, with various aspects of the political spectrum will be interesting. Just yesterday, um, Richard Trump, who's the head of the AFL-CIO, issued a statement. You heard how I believe Labor got drubbed in the election uh, and got nothing for their $110 million. But just yesterday, he issued a statement saying organized labor stands ready to work with Mr. President Trump. And interestingly, there is a very common area of interest, and that's trade. Uh, both Trump and organized labor have been against T TPP and other um, – generous trade laws. So that may be an area where we see coalitions forming and a lot of wheeling, dealing, and balancing going on uh, among different uh, political constituencies, which would be a dramatic change from the last eight years. Krista, why don't you follow up on, on the other parts of our discussion, of the question? So that's a very good question. Um, like I said, you know, a key point of the strategic enforcement plan for 2017 through 2021 is uh, you know focusing on this backlash discrimination against Muslims, Sikhs, and persons of Arab, Middle Eastern, or South uh, Asian descent, or people perceived to be part of those groups. So I, you know I imagine uh, that priority is going to change drastically given the things that you know have been said during the campaign, and I think that will happen both with new appointments and with. Uh, eliminating or, or, you know, greatly reducing the budget. Now, I did hear some scuttlebutt since uh, I spoke uh, 30 minutes ago or so that um, we may not be waiting until July 2017 for a new chair. It may happen sooner, um, so, given the new administration. So, uh, you know, I, I guess we just have to wait and see. But I do think those priorities will change. I can't imagine how they wouldn't. Um. I want to remind everybody to use the chat feature on your screens. Keep sending the questions in. We don't have that many, so uh, please keep sending them in. We have another 10 minutes to go. 
Um, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, Don, you've heard me make some comments about organized labor. What are your thoughts on ground level organizing um, and what industries and what are you seeing and what do you think is going to happen? Uh, we had the quickie election rules come down recently to sort of speed things up. We had other pronouncements to make organizing easier. What do you see happening in terms of uh, organizational effort on behalf of organized labor? Uh, I, I think that the biggest area where you're going to see uh, an uptick in unionize, unionization efforts is in higher ed. I think that given the Columbia University decision uh, that you are going to see uh, the floodgates open for graduate assistance seeking unionization uh, in the short term before anything potentially gets overturned. And uh, so I would not be surprised to see that happen uh, very quickly. There was a, a, a surge in activity in the adjunct part-time faculty ranks um, up and down the East Coast uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I think that given uh, the state of the law right now at the NORB, that the, the likelihood is you're going to see uh, many more union campaigns in the higher secondary ed, higher ed uh, area. Um, and, and just to uh, you know, make a few comments on uh, you know, the organized labor front, and I think you make a, an interesting comment about the fact that perhaps where the alliance will be uh, between organized labor and the Trump uh, presidency will be on uh, international trade and attempts to bring uh, you know, employers back into the United States for that purpose, as opposed to uh, you know, increased union unionization efforts on their own. Um, it'll be on a more global level uh, than uh, has been the case in the past. Jesse, you wanted to add some comments on this subject. Well, a larger subject, actually, I wanted to add a, a comment on, which is it strikes me um, as we're, we're kind of nearing the end here that all of our predictions and also anything uh, both a Republican Congress and a Trump administration might want to do in the labor area and the larger uh, economic regulation area is likely to get complicated uh, just due to the natural economic cycle that we're facing. You know, we've had now uh, seven to eight years of an economic expansion. Uh, if it goes for another year, it's going to be the longest economic expansion uh, in a very long time in American history. So we are unfortunately coming due for the, for the R word, uh, although it may not be a, a, a deep recession. There, there is uh, you know, some thought that the natural economic cycle is, is taking us there. And if that happens, uh, you know, throw some of these plans out the window because you'll now be responding to a very different economy where jobs are being lost, where unemployment is rising, uh, and the felt necessities of, of the Congress and administration might change. So I think that's just a, a comment about to put all this in some perspective as to where we might be headed. As, as we come towards the end, again, keep sending in questions. I, I'm going to reveal a deep, dark secret here uh, to our listeners. Um, Jesse's a Republican and LG's a Democrat. So I, I go back to LG. Um, do you have comments on this subject and would also ask you, can you work with, I don't mean you, can the Democrats work with Donald Trump and do you think there's room for dealing and negotiating on areas of importance to Democrats? And what do you think will happen in Congress in that regard? No, absolutely. I, let me start with the, the last and first, Mark. I, I think Democrats are going to be completely open to uh, working with uh, the Trump administration, uh, there, but I think there's going, and I think there's going to be a realization that those I, those issues that were central to uh, the campaigns, of first of Secretary Clinton, and then first, then and then before that of Senator Sanders, I think there's going to have to be recognition that those those items are addressed, and that's why, I, you know, going back to the initiative process, you're, you're seeing. Um, in, in, in Maine and both California, there were initiatives on the ballot to tax the wealthy. And Maine's initiative was just called this morning. It's, you know, 50, 50%, 50.4% of the vote was very close, where California's was, was a much wider burden, 62% of, of, of the vote. So I think there's going to have to be some recognition, uh, both in Congress and at the state and local levels, that they're going to have
have to be some conversations about the disparity, the wealth disparity. Uh, but there certainly are going to be uh, some question or some conversations, and I think both sides will be able to work together uh, to get things done. But you know, I, I, again, I think there's going to have to be some recognition and realization that uh, there this is going to be a very difficult time for for uh, for our country for a little bit. You know, we saw uh, protests happening, uh, you know, in Chicago and New York and Los Angeles last night. So that's why I think it's going to be incumbent upon the administration to, to start working with the Congress and on members on both sides of the aisle to, to get something moving quickly. Thanks. Uh, we, I said we weren't going to talk about this. we got four minutes left. It's the elephant in the room. First LG, then Jesse. LG, will the Affordable Care Act be repealed, amended, revised? What's going to happen? I, my, my gut tells me that... Uh, in order for uh, it, President Trump to to maintain the uh, the credibility he, he established during the uh, during the campaign, there's going to have to be, at the very least, a symbolic repeal of the of the Affordable Care Act. But then I think taking some some of the elements that work for businesses uh, into consideration and revamping those and and putting and having having that that come back in another in another form. But I do believe that he's going to have to. There's going to have to be a repeal. Jesse, if LG's right and there is a repeal, what happens after the repeal? <laughs> well, I I think there won't be a repeal without some sort of replace, uh, some sort of other plan coming into effect. Uh, I think this will be the most difficult thing they they today the Congress and and the new president tackle. Uh, just because of, of how salient it is uh, and how much people are focused on it, and it is the the key plank of the Obama legacy. So you can expect a uh, hard uh, filibuster fight in the Senate. Um, I will say this: I think if they don't get it done within his first year, they don't get it done uh, thereafter. Because I think uh, leading into the midterms in 2018, they're not going to want to do something major like that. Just my hunch. Um, so I could be wrong. He was right in predicting the election, so maybe he'll be right about this. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Allison on the CLE matters. Thanks so much, Mark, and thank you to all of our presenters uh, as well as all of our attendees today for listening. Um, so as Mark mentioned, I'm going to go ahead and read the second of today's CLE codes uh, for CLE credit. Um, this one is a combination of both letters and numbers. Uh, so please pay close attention and, again, write this down. Uh, there will be a similar polling question field slide uh, immediately after the announcement of the code itself. Uh, again, it will be open for about a minute to, to input your response. Uh, remember to hit submit when you're done. If for whatever reason the field goes away before you can see it, it is timed automatically. So if that does happen, uh, please instead uh, input your CLE code five digits uh, into the Q&A widget. Uh, we will record that as well. That gets put out in our reports uh, and will be tagged to your specific uh, attendee ID. So that is not an issue if you somehow miss the, uh, the actual polling question field. Uh, so at this moment, I'm going to read the second and final course code for today's presentation. That code is the letters S as in Sam, R as in Robert, the number 9, the letter A as in Adam, and the number seven. Repeating that once more, the code is the letters S as in Sam, R as in Robert, the number nine, the letter A as in Adam, and the number seven. Again, if you're seeking CLE, be sure to enter the second and final code in the information box that you see on your screen now or into the Q&A widget on your screen.